Hello fellow Truth Seekers, this is Barbara Jean. Um, I had a dream last night. Um, interesting dream. I don't remember most of the details, but there's a couple of details that do I do recall. And they had to do with doors and houses. Um, but I I have I have a lot to talk about. And I think I might have to make two videos. Because uh, it's quite complicated. Um, and uh, I already tried to make a video. <laughs> it ran on for about 40, 50 minutes. And I still didn't get to half of what I wanted to say. So I'm going to try to. This is my second chance of doing it. Or second time doing this. So I'm trying to. I'm going to try to make it more concise. Uh, writing it down might help. But I don't. I don't work that way. I have to think out loud. So, stay with me. There's a lot. I'm, I'm trying to roll in. Like I said, I'm going to have to probably make two videos trying to get this all, everything that's been going on in my head here. Um, let me just first start by reading, before I tell you my, my dreams, if I get to the dreams here in this video, I'm not sure. But let me start with a couple of uh, verses here. A couple of passages from the Bible. 2 Timothy 3.1 This know also that in the last day, days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of all those of those things that are good, traitors, heady, high minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. Uh, for of this sort uh, are they which creep into houses and lead silly lead captive silly women laden with sins led away but with diverse lust ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth now as janus and jambres withstood moses so do these also resist the truth men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith but they shall proceed no further for their folly shall be manifest unto all men as theirs also was isn't that good news good news so we have, this is, this is a terrible time of utter, utter selfishness, self-indulgence, and people who are completely uh, reprobate in their thinking. And they're led astray by these men who, uh, they have led them down this path. Uh, Janus and Jambres, who withstood Moses, who stood, withstood Moses, the lawgiver. Um, they withstood him, and they were of this kind, this ilk. They were this ilk, leading the people of God astray. So um, they resist the truth. Men of corrupt mind reprobate concerning the faith. But here's the good news. But they but they shall proceed no further. Now this is talking about the last days. Now, no, in the last days. So this isn't the last days, people. This is the last days prophecy. prophecy. So the good news is they shall proceed no further. For their folly shall be manifest unto all men as theirs also was. Good news. Keep that in mind. Now, I want to read also uh, 2 Corinthians 10, 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through, the, through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ and having an, an, uh, in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Okay, so this is also good news. So, uh, we are, we're in a warfare. It's a warfare for our minds. Uh, we're not fighting flesh and blood. We are fighting, uh, our weapons of our warfare are not carnal. In other words, not fleshly, but they're for the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against what? The knowledge of God and bring into captivity every thought. We're bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. This is important. Please keep these two passages in mind during what I'm trying to say to you, because this is exactly what I'm trying to say to you. And having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Now, isn't that, that's also good news. Good news. Good news, people, is once we have come into obedience and when we have fully 
cap taken captive every vain thought and imagination and everything that exalts itself in our minds and our imaginations against the knowledge of God. And we brought everything into captivity, every thought into captivity. And that's when we become fully obedient to God. And when we're fully obedient to God, that's when God, we have to be ready in God to revenge all disobedience. Why is that? Because guess what, people? We're all guilty of disobedience. Okay? Now, if we're all guilty of disobedience, how is God going to separate us from the, from the goats? The sheep and the goats are kind of mingled right now. We kind of got some same similarities. We may even be doing the same things. But God is separating the sheep from the goat. He's separating us, separating and separating and separating until there's no lack of distinction between us. There is no indistinction between us. There's there's going to be no question as to who's the sheep and who's the goats. Okay? The sheep hears the voice of the Lord and they, they're obedient. So once we are fully obedient, this is what it says, your obedience is fulfilled. We have to be in readiness to revenge all disobedience. Because while we're still in disobedience, the people of God are still in disobedience. God would be having to, dis to discipline all of us. He would have to revenge his, himself on all, every last one of us. Every last one of us would be guilty of disobedience. So therefore, God would have to take revenge on all of us. But he doesn't want to do that. He wants to separate his people, those from the obedient to the... So when our obedience is fulfilled and when we've come into full obedience to the Lord, that's when he's going to... We, at, with through Christ, have to be in readiness to revenge all disobedience. What? Isn't that interesting? Now, this is interesting. Now, remember my last video, I was talking about how I was going into this cavern, this cavernous area, this, in a tavern. It was very dark. It was made of stone. Um, it's cold. It's dark. And there was a room off to my left-hand side I knew I had to go into. But it was so dark, even my flashlight wasn't working properly. At least I didn't see I could see anything, but I knew there was a beast in there. And there was another door that I had to open. And I was afraid to open that door. I was afraid to open the door. But I knew I had to open the door and release the beast. And so when I woke up, I prayed. I asked the Lord to give me courage to see what it was behind that door and open it. Next dream I have, I'm having this dream about dinosaurs. Dreaming about reptiles. Chasing, being chased by raptors and T-Rexes. This went on for quite a long time. Okay? But once they were released in the, into the light... And no longer hidden in the dark, I could see what they were and where they were and how they were going to attack. I could, I was conscious of them. I became conscious of the beast that was being hidden that I couldn't see before. I was fe fearful and unfrightened of that was hidden behind a door, behind, in the dark, in the unconscious mind. Now, I'm going to read something here. Now, the Lord, since the Lord showed me that this whole thing started to snowball in my head. I'm starting to see things. I can understand. I understand the enmity for the woman more. Makes more sense to me. Um, uh, the relational things between men and women, how important it is and, and why the reptile brain doesn't accept it and can't accept it. I, um, I'm, I'm seeing how the unconscious mind, how we've been controlled when we ate that fruit, that seed of Satan, that reptilian DNA went into our system and changed our minds, which is why we're in a battle, because it says here in 2 Corinthians, we're in a battle for our minds, people. And how we have to take captive every thought. And when every thought is in obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ, and we become back to that original state of being in faith to Jesus Christ, and we have conquered the reptile brain, we are then ready to revenge uh, all disobedience because then we are, will no longer be part of that that system. Now, I'm going to read a, an article that I found. Um, I was looking for something to read for um, the reptilian brain. And uh, this is, is a very interesting article. It was written by uh, Mazastic, M-A-Z-Z-A-S-T-I-C-K, Mazastic. It's a, their, web, their website, uh, www.mazastic.com. Are you behaving like a reptile? Uh, reptile, I'm going to read a few excerpts from here because there's quite a bit here to read, but it's a long article. But it's got a lot of interesting things here to say. I looked up Wikipedia, but I didn't, I didn't find anything 
really that really spoke to me but this one does the reptilian brain lizard behavior in humans uh McLean was has shown that the R complex reptilian brain shows an important role in aggression be, aggressive behavior territorially territoriality ritual and the establishment of social hierarchies despite occasional welcome exceptions this seems to me to be the characteristic of a great deal of modern human bureaucratic bureaucratic and political behavior which is interesting with what i just said here casting down every natural a high thing exalts itself against the knowledge of god uh, and how these people john generous uh john oh where is it now janice and jambras withstood moses so do uh, also resist the truth men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith and how they've corrupted in, in uh to homes of guilt-ridden women um uh, let's, see, let's let's see here um keep going down here let me just read some more things here there's quite a few things that are quite interesting um and this talks about his uh, first talks about how his i think it's a he we have a body but where is is the user manual i started my personal growth journey in 1997 and the first area i studied was psychology and the brain i noticed how easily i was triggered an unconscious emotional reaction as a child and young adult before the term triggered was even used and i believe what gets triggered is in us is the reptilian brain advertisers and other uh other media outlets know this and this is the reason why most media and fear-based are fear is fear-based because it gets people's attention the reptilian brain is a metaphor for the behavior it creates in us humans what is the reptilian brain the reptilian brain serpentine brain lizard brain or r complex is known as the oldest part of the brain i'll use these terms interchangeably throughout the article this they all mean the same thing. The serpentine brain consists of the upper part of the spinal cord and the basal ganglia and the diencephalon and regions of the midbrain and all of which sits atop the spinal column like a knob in the middle of our heads. This part of the brain functions uh, fun, fun, fundamentally influences our behavior and controls body functions regards, required for sustaining life, such as breathing and body temperature. The reptile brain also is where re repeating patterns such as rituals, automatic responses, without conscious thought, predict that's important, un, without conscious thought, predictability, fear of losing a job, spouse, home, dying, lack of money and resources and the unknown or all anxiety and trauma responses all and the unknown or all anxiety and trauma responses i've always admired people who were willing to take leaps of faith and go go for it like quitting a job and moving to another country lizard brains often label these people as crazy and unstable I beg to differ. These people act in, in spite of their lizard brains, allowing them to experience life as it meant to be free and boundless. Hmm. That's those people of faith. So lizard brains label people of faith as crazy and unstable. Isn't that interesting? But this, this person who's writing this says that, no, they're free and boundless. Hmm. People who live by faith. Once people are in fear of not surviving, the fear center of the brain takes over and we are at the mercy of its reaction to perceived threats the news media targets this part of the brain system by telling us the latest tragedy or economic woes many institutions are designed and set up by the reptilian brain systems controlled and influenced by the reptilian brain educational systems government military judicial religion and business when the lizard brain is controlling someone their behavior can affect other people's brain responses as well we can be calm and relaxed and collect one minute but the if someone is displaying serpentine behavior be, behaviors while in our presence, it can affect our behaviors as well unless we remain what conscious. Unless we remain conscious. So it's talking about it, the reptiles can control you as long as you're you're behaving in an unconscious way. But when you became become conscious and aware of what's going on around you and other people's behavior, and you become conscious of it, you, the reptile brain can no longer fun, uh, control you. This is very interesting. This is what the Bible says here is first second Corinthians, casting down imaginations and every thought, high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ, becoming conscious. 
The desire to control, whether it be in relationships, circumstances, or in life in general, is a primary trait of the reptilian brain in action. We often call these people displaying this behavior control freaks, and freak-like is what they appear to be. Hmm. Have you ever been so stressed that you, you began holding your, your head in with both hands for fear that your brain is going to explode? If so, it is your reptilian brain that is trying to get, uh, get under control. You are trying to get under control. So if you're putting your head like, ah, it's because you're trying to control the reptile brain. That's what it says this is in this article. Now, this is interesting too. List of 25 reptilian brain characteristics. Territoriality, um, a hierarchy, uh, number two, a hierarchical structure of power, control, ownership, wars, jealousy, anger, fear, hostility, worry, stuck or frozen with fear, addictions, anxiety, aggressiveness, conflict, extreme behavior, competitiveness, cold bloodedness, cold blooded, dog eat dog believes, might is right in survival of the fittest. OCD, hoarding, looting, superstitions, deceptions, uh, fight or flight responses or freeze, obesity from fear of lack of food, food scarcity, daily rituals, ceremonial, ceremonial reenactments. So that would be religion. So religious um, actions. Um, isn't this interesting? I, you know, I don't know if you noticed uh, that none of these are actually the characteristics of God. There's none of these. There's these are the, actually the opposites of everything that God is. God is love. God is love. And when you read 1 Corinthians 13, none of these things show up there. Perfect love casts out fear. <laughs> God is a God of peace and love. And he, he's generous and he gives and he, he shares and he's... And he, none of these things here. Every last one of these things here is opposite of what our God is. Every last one. The reptilian brain has the capacity to overpower the ability to have common rational thought, losing our heads. These traits all stem from the belief of not, of not enough or lack of mentality. It's all about survival when it comes to the reptilian brain. Emotional res responses based on the fear of not surviving is why the marketers and news outlets always use fear to get you to watch or buy their products. Power, status, reputation, basically the sense of self. The reptilian brain doesn't like change or new viewpoints. That is why it seems that near impossible to enact any real difference as far as, as politics goes. The reptilian brain fears change and any real change as far as, as policy can be a real nightmare to get enacted. News views um, in science, politics, religion, education, medicine, and rep the reptilian brain sees this as a threat and will always defend itself. Consciousness always wins in the long run, but not without taking out a few casualties. The reptilian brain doesn't know the difference between real and imagined, and its thoughts about events are just as real as the real thing. Anxiety is a state caused by the reptilian brain, even when nothing is, is happening that should cause us to feel anxious. There's a gnawing away in the belly that something bad is going to happen. By the way, the reptilian brain doesn't like surprises either. Now, this is interesting because... In my last video, I, I, I had to delete it because it was too long and it was getting out of control. Um, I brought up something that had to do with the stomach. And I had this, this feeling I had in my stomach. I had God had, a few days ago gave me this funny feeling in my stomach. And I'll talk, talk to you about that in a second here as soon as I finish this article. Um, and it has to do with the Church of Pergamos. Now, I'm just going to keep going. So just to read that one little sentence again. There's a gnawing away in the belly that something bad is going to happen. By the way, the reptilian brain doesn't like surprises either. Um, okay, I want to go down. You can read the rest, some of this yourself. Um, talks about survival. Uh, how to overcome. Let's go down, go down to how to overcome the reptilian brain. Consciousness is the only way to be free from the effects of the reptilian brain. That means knowing the difference between real and imagined. The imagination is a beautiful tool, but can also create doomsday scenarios in your mind. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought through the obedience of Christ. So, Consciousness is the only way to be free from the effects of the reptilian brain. That means knowing the difference between real and imagined. The imagination is a beautiful tool, but can also be created, create doomsday scenarios in your mind. 
remain conscious of your thoughts and when you get unsettled feelings in your body focus on what ideas you have been having Re redirect them to beliefs that make you feel good and empower you the reptilian brain always responds to thoughts as if they are happening in real life okay that's interesting um let me see Let's see if i can go down to why am i telling you this um let me hear um, i wonder if i should keep going or just stop here He's, this person is trying to tell us that we can have control over it. Um, Seth Godin, the lizard brain. Okay, this I want to read this little bit here too. It says Seth Godin. This is written by Seth Godin. A little, little something. I'm just going to read a couple of things from here. The lizard brain is hungry, scared, angry, and horny. Hmm. The lizard brain only wants to eat and be safe. The lizard brain will fight to the death if it has to, but will rather run away. It's like a, it's like a vendetta and has no trouble getting angry. The lizard brain cares what everyone else thinks because status in the tribe is essential to survival. Uh, okay, so and then it goes on. He goes on a little bit more. And I think that's all I want to say about that. Okay. All right. You can read that for yourself. But anyway, <coughs> why am I bringing all this up? Because like I said, this dream I had about opening the door opening a door the church of philadelphia is about opening doors going into those hidden mysteries those hidden places that you not really wanting to go those hidden places that you don't want to think about those hidden mysteries of god that are scary places that are scary but having the courage to do it because you're walking with christ christ and the holy spirit gives you the courage to go to those places that are scary and hard to face so I opened the door, out comes these dinosaurs, out come the reptiles. I'm seeing the reptiles, okay? They're chasing me around, they're chasing us around. And this is what's got control of our minds, the imagination of their, the, the danger of them, the imagination of their, um, their fierceness, the imagination of what they can do to us if we let them go, imagination of all the, the imagination, the fear of them, had more control of you when you just imagine what they can do to you than what they can actually do to you. You know what I'm saying? Our imagination is that strong. And the the reptile, that's what the Lord was saying. He was releasing those thoughts. He's releasing these, releasing, uh, uh, we are becoming conscious. We're becoming conscious of the reptiles and those people, the Janices and the Jambers of, the, of this world who have controlled us through our our vain imaginations, because of our guilt-ridden minds, have gotten control of us. They've come into our houses and got control of our minds because of our guilt. And our guilt-ridden minds. And they know exactly how to control us. Okay? Now, um, this is all so interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm just amazed by what the Lord is showing me here. So, anyway, a few days ago, I had this, um, I've been praying for a long, long time, many years now about my weight. Okay. Obvious. I'm huge. I'm massive. I didn't always have a problem with my weight. I didn't. I was once very slender. Uh, had, my, everyone used to say I had a lovely figure. Um, I couldn't see it, but they all, uh, my family and friends always said I had a lovely figure, which okay was new to me. But nonetheless, that was beside the point. There were times when I was I was quite comfortably, I mean, being a, a heavy boned person, my weight was always higher than my little tiny boned friends who would always be under a certain weight. And I would feel like, oh, maybe I should be that weight too. So I would try to get down to that weight. And of course, I couldn't sustain it. And so I started this roller coaster thing of go up and down and up and down and up and down and up and down. And there were times when I was really underweight. I should have been a lot bigger than I was, or at least, you know, weight wise. Um, and so I became. Uh, this roller coaster thing started happening in my head. Uh, I couldn't get down to this weight, and I don't know, I wasn't, I wasn't good like them, or I wasn't as attractive as other people because I wasn't down to a certain weight. Now, now that that was that was just the beginning. Okay, now I I started in this um um. I started to gain weight, but I was always faithful about exercising. I used to exercise, and it was just walking my dog up and down the all over the neighbors, up and down the hills, and 
and I'd walk him for an hour, maybe longer, sometimes shorter, but usually about an hour, almost every day I'd walk the dog. And um, so I was, I was used to exercise. I enjoyed long hikes. I enjoyed walking. I enjoyed doing my, my aerobics. Um, you know, I, I was always conscious of health and I usually ate pretty good. I mean, I had moments when I binged like everybody else over eight, they did this, but you know, it wasn't really a problem until about 10 years ago. It's only 10 years ago when all this stuff started happening, I started to eat more than I should. Okay. Eat things that I probably shouldn't. And so that's, that helped the problem that of course that you're seeing now but also what happened was my legs started to do some very strange things my legs swelled up my feet swelled up everything went wrong started having all kinds of strange things happen to me and anyway but this why am i telling you all this i'm telling you this because i've been praying about this for years now just this started back back in my 20s i was praying about my weight praying all the way all the way back about my weight and and how I really want to be motivated to exercise and eat better and okay and I didn't like I said I didn't really have a problem with it until about 10 years ago when suddenly the Lord gave me this prophetic ministry and now I'm full of fears and anxieties um, I started uh, like I said I went from um, this place, I, I was like so happy to, to know that Jesus had come into my life. Jesus was there. I could feel his presence. I knew he was there. He's practically tangible. I couldn't see him, but he was tangible people. And I knew it was Jesus. And then all of a sudden he puts me into this position and I'm, I'm completely confused by what's going on. And, and, then I said, okay, well, the Lord, I'm going to trust the Lord. I've always trusted the Lord. I'm going to continue to trust the Lord. And then he puts this spirit on me, the spirit of the bride, and suddenly I'm full of fears, anxieties, all kinds of things. And I'm eating like out of control. And I don't know why. Okay. Now, it's I, I know the day when it came, when it happened. I, one day I was lying in my bed. I haven't slept in my bed in years now, people. I haven't slept in my bed for years. I, I have a very comfortable bed. Just over here, I have a very comfortable bed. It's lovely. It's soft. It's the softest bed you want to get into. Oh, it's beautiful. But I haven't slept in it in years. One day I got up out of my bed. And I suddenly, as I stood up, the whole world just seemed like it span. It, I, it suddenly just, I, the world like it twirled around me. And I had to grab my, my dresser, which was beside my bed. And I grabbed it because I, to keep from falling down. And I knew that was the moment something changed, something altered. And the spirit came on me, the spirit of this bride, and this confusion and the fear and the anxiety and all that stuff that I didn't have before suddenly was there. And I was experiencing this corporate feeling of what was going on in Christ's bride and his church. And I'm telling you, there was fear, there was confusion, there was all kinds of stuff going on that I wasn't experiencing before, but suddenly I was having. And I've been working through those things, one thing at a time, and in that, and the Lord keeps bringing things up, which is what I've been trying to tell you for the last 10 years. I've been sitting in this chair over here to my right. I've been sitting in this chair, and it's not it's not a lounge chair. It doesn't you can't you can't go back and lie out full, flat on it. You can't. You have to sit up. I sit up. Night after night, I sit up in this chair. Occasionally, I try to force myself to lie down on my sofa for an hour or two just to get flat. But I don't lie for hours and hours because I can't. I just sit back in my chair. And the Lord continues to do brain surgery me day after day after day after day, working on casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. I'm bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. That's what's going on in my head. The Lord is, I'm telling you, he's doing brain surgery. I mean, he's doing brain surgery. What is he doing? He's dealing with the reptilian brain, brain that we were infected with in the Garden of Eden. Every thought that has been put into the brain of humanity that has controlled us through fear. Let me find that article again. A second, let me find that article. The 25 things. 
<sighs> territoriality, territoriality, the hierarchy of power, control, ownership, wars, jealousy, anger, fear, hostility, worry, stuck and frozen with fear, addictions, anxiety, aggressiveness, conflict, extreme behavior, competitiveness, cold bloodedness, doggy. Dog hoarding, looting, superstition, deceptions, fight or flight, freeze, obesity, lack of food, daily rituals, or that's religion, ceremonial reenactments. Every day, that's what he's working on with my brain. That's why these thoughts come to the surface. Those thoughts that are left captive in your head, right back in the, this, what they call the serpentine or the reptile brain, where it's captive in there. God is bringing it to the surface, which is what he's doing with the brain surgery. He agitates and he agitates and he agitates until it comes to the surface and it becomes conscious. Until it becomes a conscious thought and no longer stuck in the subconscious mind. And no longer when it comes becomes conscious, you're no longer controlled by it. When it remains unconscious, as long as it remains in the dark, you are controlled by it and you don't even realize it. But when you can face your fears and it comes to the surface, then you can look at it and say, hey, why am I afraid of that? Why am I afraid of that? Hmm. That doesn't go along with my, what I know about God. That doesn't go along with what I know, my knowledge about Jesus. That doesn't go along with the, what the word says. You see what I'm saying? So this is, this is really, really good news, people. This is good news. God is bringing, like I said, the Lord gave me this prophetic ministry for the bride of Christ that he's going to remove and every spot and wrinkle from his bride in order to bring every thought and captivity, everything that is contrary to the thoughts and knowledge of God is coming to the surface. And we must be getting really close to the end of this because if he's talking to me and bringing up out in my mind reptiles dinosaurs that reptilian seed he's going he's going real deep people and we are so close to being at this point of the good news where is having in readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled isn't that amazing now i want to I hope you're seeing what I'm saying here. This is huge stuff. This is massive. Like I said, it also explains to me um, the enmity for the woman. It, made, it makes it a lot more sense as to why there's enmity for the woman. The reptilian brain is not relational. The reptilian brain doesn't understand man and woman together as one. They don't get it. The religious mind, that reptilian brain, is religious. Okay? It explains to me Job and his situation a lot better. I mean, I always knew it, but now I understand it even better. Okay? And it, 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 why God is not satisfied or happy with religious ideologies? Because religion is reptilian. Religion is a, is a reptilian idea. And all those people, even Christians, even Christians are religious. In other words, they believe if you do something enough times, it makes you righteous. If you sacrifice enough, it makes you righteous. If you go to church every week, it makes you righteous. If you um, cut your food a certain way, it makes you righteous. If you put your shoes on in, in a certain order, it makes you righteous. If you do something over and over and over in a compulsive, obsessive sort of way, in a religious, religious sort of way, it makes you righteous. That's what a reptilian would think. Okay, if I pray every morning and every night, every day morning, and do it religiously, it makes me righteous. But it's not relational. And Job was very religious. He was very religious, but he was not relational. He might have been okay with his friends. His friends, he seemed to have a great relationship with his friends. But his wife, not so much. His children, mm -mm. He was, while they, his children were having a party, he was out sacrificing just in case they should happen to sin and the sin fall on his head. And when his wife come to him and who knew his heart, his wife was very, his wife knew who he was. She wasn't fooled. Now you just curse God and die. I mean, I know you, I know you, Job. I know you better than you think you do. I, I do. I know you, Job. Why don't you just say what's in your heart and curse him and die? But Job course being religious and also having a spark of humanity still in him knew that this was not the thing to do 
but he wouldn't admit he was a sinner. And then he turns around and curses his wife. He didn't do that to his friends, but he did that to his wife, his wife, his wife, people. I can't say they had a very good relationship. I don't know about you. It was not a relational relationship. He was concerned about how, and you read the book of Job, he was very concerned about how other people looked at him. He was very concerned about how society viewed him. His pride was such, look what people are going to say about me. He wasn't concerned about the fact that he'd lost his children. He, oh, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Where's the grief? Where's the grief? I don't see any grief. When you read the book of Job, you don't see any grief for his kids. You don't see any grief for his relationship with his wife. The way he says to her, talk to his wife is terrible. She lost her children too, people. She lost her children too. She was in grief. She was in mourning. She was in, she was in pain. Get away from me, you stupid woman. What? No. By the end of, time, the end of that book, God is revealing to Job, seriously, what his problem was. The reptilian brain. The seed of Satan. It was there, people. And it's in every last one of us, every last Christian on this planet and person on this planet is infected with that same seed. And God, everything that's in that, that list of everything that says what a reptilian does, and what they're concerned with is the opposite of our God. God is love. He is not reptilian in any way of thinking. And that's what God is taking us back. And he removes the last little bit of that seed of Satan from our minds. We will be like him too. And we will go back to being like God, which we were in the beginning when we were creating the image of God, male and female. We were created in the image of God, male and female. We were created to be like God in the beginning. And when we disobeyed and we took that seed of Satan in us, we got that reptilian brain stuck in us, changed our minds. And there's more people on this earth who are more affected than others. The Christians have an advantage because when we are given, we give our lives to Jesus Christ, he begins the process of removing the reptilian seed. Now, um, when you are born again, when you're baptized, that's a different thing altogether as well. Doesn't mean that you're perfect, but it means that God starts a process of sanctification and removing that old, all those fears, the anxiety, the anger, the hurt, all that stuff starts to come to the surface. That's what God's doing. He's trying to remove it from us and bring it to the surface. That's what those anxieties and funny feelings are. Now, a few days ago, I had a very funny thing happen. I was sitting in my chair and I heard this. I was in this, that, that subconscious mind that you know, you're mostly asleep or half asleep and half conscious, half asleep, half conscious, that kind of REM state. And I heard this bring, <laughs> it was just like bring, like you hear when you're getting a message on your computer or on your, your phone, when someone's sending you an email, you know, you're getting a message from in your, in your hotmail or whatever it is that you have, you're getting a message and you get that bring, that's what I heard <laughs> sitting in my chair. Bring. And, and I knew I was getting a message and what effectively immediately was my stomach. I felt it immediately. I felt this butterfly feeding in my stomach, butterflies. So as I heard it, ring, butterflies. And I knew God was doing something. He was sending me a message, but it went to my stomach. Now this is interesting. So here's my little chart again. Here's, we are the bride of Christ and we are representing the Holy Spirit. And here's the seven stages of full maturity. Now here is um, the stomach area and it's the color yellow. And it represents the third stage of maturity, um, which is in the stomach area. And it's yellow. Now, yellow represents, interesting, the color represents knowledge. Now, um, so casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. 2 Corinthians 10. Now, I want to go to Revelation chapter 2, the, the church of Pergamos, which is the... the the church, uh, the third church, which is represented here with the yellow. This is Ephesus. This is Thyatira. Uh, uh, um, this is Ephesus. This is Sardis. This is Pergamos, Thyatira, um, um, Smyrna. Is it Smyrna? I always get Sardis. Smyrna. This is Smyrna. 
This is Sardis. This is Philadelphia. And this is Laodicea. Okay. So there are stages of, of growth and maturity in the body of Christ. And this represents the energy centers of the body. And so here we have here, this, this is the stomach area. The stomach is a very, very strong um, energy center. Of course, it's where we process our food. We eat food, it goes in our mouth, goes to our stomach. And it sits there for quite a while in the stomach. And the stomach is a very strong area of our, our our body our body's health if you put good food in you get good you know get you get good results for your body now this is interesting this is interesting okay so i'm having i'm telling you about my weight how i'm having this problem with my weight it's all really really started about 10 years ago 11 years ago when all this thing started happening this pros, this prophetic stuff started happening now i want you to see this so i get a message bring my my stomach i get butterflies I know something is going on. So here's the church of Pergamos. This is Revelation chapter 2, verse 12. And to the angel of the church of Pergamos, write, These things saith he that has the sharp, sharp sword of two, with two edges. I know thy works and where thy dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. Satan's seat? It's in the stomach. What did Satan do? He didn't bite them when he infected them. He didn't uh, wrap himself around their foot or their, their head or their toes or their arms. What did he do? He infected a piece of fruit and he told them to eat. He told them to eat. I know thy works and where thy dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. It's in our stomach. And thou holdest the fast thy name, and has, and thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days where Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan where where Satan dwells. Satan dwells in the stomach. Isn't that interesting? But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there the, the whole the, the the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to cast stumbling blocks before the children of Israel to eat, to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Huh. Isn't this interesting? This is the compromised church. This is the church that has um, mixed paganism with Christianity, Christ, with Christianity. This is the pagan church. Okay. Um, and this is very interesting. If you think about it, where Satan dwells. Um, so they they have also false prophets. Uh, that would be the Genesis and the Jambres of this world. The Genesis and the Jambres dwell here. Um, but they ask them to eat things sacrificed to idols. To commit fornication. So hast thou um, also them that hold the doctrine of Nicolaitans, which things I hate. That's the doctrine of child abuse. Repent. Change your mind. Remove that serpent seed from your thinking. Or else I will come unto thee quickly and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. It's not he, the same sword he was mentioning in the beginning. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give what? I will give to eat of the hidden manna. And will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saith he that receives it. What? It's a message. What? <laughs> the Lord is so amazing. I'm just thinking this. He's, he's sending them a message. To him that overcometh will I get to eat. Oh my gosh. The hidden manna and will give him a white stone and the, the stone a new name which written no man knoweth save he that receives it. So they're getting a, they're going to get a message. He will give them something to eat true food, untainted food, 
heavenly food because they've been removed that's been taken over where Satan is no longer dwelling in that place. Even though they were living in that area where Satan dwells, Satan no longer dwells in there. And the hidden eat things that they've eaten will no longer affect their stomach. And I got a message. Bring! And I felt my stomach tingle. I got a message. He's given me hidden manna. And he's not only just given me hidden manna, He's given me a new name. He's given me a new name. He's given us a new name. Now, this is... <laughs> oh, I'm so excited. Can you tell? <laughs> oh, my gosh, people. This is amazing. Wait till I tell you this. This revelation is coming to me as I'm just talking this out. I've got to talk things out, people, because that's when the Lord gives me the revelations. This is amazing. So in my last video, I was telling you that I had this, this strange dream where I, was, where I was putting these placemats out for the, the nations, right? But before that, I was on the phone. I was on the phone. I was trying to get through to somebody. I knew who it was on the other end. But I first gave him a company name. And I, I can't remember what the name of the company it was. Three words. Something, something, something. I was calling. I'm calling for something, so, so and so and so and so. And they didn't recognize me and they hung up. And so when I called them a second time, then I recognized, I, I identified myself. I said, this is you know, me, Barb Jean, and I need to talk to you. And then we had this very short but pleasant conversation. And the woman on the other end was a woman I used to work with. Her name was Donna. I knew it was Donna. Okay. <laughs> and so anyway, uh, that was the end of that part of the dream. And then I went on to this placing mats for the nations, the sheep nations on these tables. Okay. Now, this is amazing. So then just this morning, I had another dream. And this dream has to do with portals. I was opening doors. We were going through even this magical door, magical portals, like it was transporting us from one dimension to another. And I was with a group of people. And one place I was in a house with some, uh, again, with some people. I knew my eldest sister was there. She represents the church of Ephesus in my dreams. So the law, I guess, you know, she represents the law, um, the righteousness of, of the law. So she was, she was in this dream as well. But what was really interesting, although I remember, forgot a lot of the details, and it had to do with houses. I was in houses, and it was had to do with rebuilding and all these other things, Re redecorating and rebuilding a particular room in a house. This, what was interesting was the two women showed up in my dream, which was amazing to me. I was so happy. Oh my gosh, I was so happy when I saw these two women in the same room. They had both, in my dream, had flown from where they lived to where I live in order to to see me. They both come to see me at the same time. And what this dream was, um, my friend who represents the church of Laodicea, her name's Leanne. She flew in from where she lives in Toronto. She flew in my dream to, to be with me. She came to meet me in my, this house. My sister was there. And another woman who I, who's a dear friend to me in my heart, I hadn't spoken to her in years, not because I don't want to, because I, and I, I wonder, why don't I contact her? Why don't I contact her? Why don't I contact her? But it's like something inside of me is saying, no, you, you've got to stay focused. This is, this is your, this is your group of contact. And most of the people, only people I really talk to and contact is my sisters. The only one I really speak to on a regular basis or have to have any real interaction with is my sisters. And okay, of course, it includes my family and rest of my family, but for most part, mostly my sisters. But this was amazing because she's dear to me. This woman is absolutely dear to my heart. I think about her every single day. There's not a day that doesn't go by. She's not in my mind. Okay. She was a dear, dear, dear friend to me. She helped me through a lot of things in my late teens to my early 20s. Her name is Donna. I was so happy to see her in my dreams. Oh my gosh. I was so, I was, oh, so happy to see her. And to see my dearest friend, Leanne, and Donna in the same room together. And they were both coming to see me at the same time. 
oh my goodness, I was so happy in my dreams. Oh, and I even said so in my dreams. I said, I just, this is the most exciting thing. My two dearest friends in the whole world are here right now together. That's what I said in my dream. You're here together to see me. This is the most exciting thing. And I was so excited. I, I, I'm telling you, this is how I felt when I saw them in my dream together in the same room coming to see me. <laughs> and now... <laughs> This is amazing to me because when I looked up the name, I just got up, I looked up the name Donna. Donna means lady, but it also means world ruler. Let's see if I can find it here. I will look this up. It says, what does Donna mean? Uh, Donna means lady, but it also means world ruler. Okay. You are strong. You are strong in material matters, determined and stubborn. You have good business ability. You are a good worker, steady, steady, practical, and a builder who takes responsibility well. These qualities may bring you to a position of authority and power. You are a doer, down-to-earth, serious-minded, reliable, and self-disciplined, and have, uh, have good power of concentration. You are frank, methodical, and believe in law, system, and order. Creative and outgoing, you will always look you're always looking for an opportunity to show your abilities, especially before before audiences. You are very flexible and like to feel appreciated. You are looking for a chance to mix with others sociably and to communicate with his ideas. You like to talk and can relate easily to different cultures and concepts. The biggest challenge is, is for you is uncertainty. Okay, so I think all I need to say about that. But what I'm saying is, <sighs> the Lord gave me this prophetic ministry. And what he's saying is that we have now, we've just crossed a hurdle. We've just defeated the enemy on another level. We have, uh, we've become powerful. We've become a lady. That's what Donna means. And when I think of this woman, my friend Donna, who I adore, I just love her so much. And one of these days, I'm going to call her, be back in contact with her. And, and I'm going to let her know she's been on my mind every single day. I've never stopped thinking about her, ever. But when I think of her, that's when I, what I just read to you. That's her. That's Donna. She is the most ladylike lady I've ever met. She is just a wonderful person. And when I saw her in the room with my friend, my other dearest, dearest friend in the world, in the same room together to see me, I knew God was sending me a message. He's sending his bride a message. He's sending us a message. That's what he, that's what the butterfly, the bring and the message was. He's sending us a message. We've become a lady. We've become a rule, a world ruler. We have crossed into a new dimension. We have overcome the reptilian brain that Satan's trying to keep us under, under this reptilian brain thinking. That's his thinking. He, we have overcome it. Oh my gosh, this is amazing stuff, people. Oh, this is amazing. We have overcome. And you know what's really strange? Not strange, but wonderful. In the last couple of days, since this all started happening, this felt, I felt different. I'm feeling different about food. All of a sudden, food doesn't seem to be this compulsion to me. I'm feeling like I'm back to where I was before. You know, that more disciplined feeling about feeling, okay, now I can fast. or now I can do this. But the last 10 years, I haven't been able to fast, people. I wanted to fast and tried to fast, but I haven't been able to. I once fasted 21 days. I once fasted 21 days with no food, just water. And I used to fast regularly. Regularly. It was never a problem for me. But all of a sudden, the last 10 years, I couldn't do it. It's like something's changed. We have, he's saying, sending us a message, people. He's sending us a message. We're overcoming this area. Oh my gosh. This is so amazing. I'm just overwhelmed. Um, wow. I didn't expect this to go there. Wow. Yeah. Uh, well, I hope you're finding this as exciting as I am because this is amazing stuff, people. Like I said, if this was just for me, if this was just for me, 
then of course that wouldn't mean anything to you. But I'm giving you this message because this isn't just for me. Like I said, I didn't have a problem 10 years ago with my food like I had now. Why? Why all of a sudden in the last 10 years? Well, because he gave me the spirit of the bride. That's why. And what he, when I overcome this and he gave me these dreams, and some dreams are for me, personally for me, but these dreams are for his church and for his bride and for his people. We are going to over, overcoming people. We are overcoming. This isn't just about me. This is about all of us. And we are being set free from the, the reptilian brain and t being changed back because we're changing our minds. God is changing our minds and we're becoming more and more and more and more like him. Like I said, Jesus cannot be unequally yoked. He will not be unequally yoked. That means he will not marry a bride who has a spot or a wrinkle in her. Not one single solitary little... <clears throat> everything is going to be uncovered. Everything is going to be removed. Everything that can be cleaned up is going to be cleaned up. Everything is going to be nothing left. And we must be really, really, really close. That's all I'm saying. You must be really, really close. This is where my mind is going. Now, I want to make some more. I have some more thoughts that are going around in my head about uh, um, this this reptilian brain and how it has affected our our thinking and relational, a re relational thinking, and also has changed us from um, understanding the. The relationship of the Holy Spirit, and like I said, I've talked to you about this before, but I can understand now why the reptilian brain has rejected the Holy Spirit as being feminine. It can't. It can't receive it. It will not. The religious spirit, that reptilian brain, cannot receive the Holy Spirit as being feminine. But unfortunately for Christians, if you or anybody who cannot understand the Holy Spirit being feminine, you can never be truly free because the the the, the spirit of freedom is. We've got to set the woman free from its captive, from her captivity. You've got to, in order to be fully free, you've got to do that. But that's another, that's for another video. But I'm just telling you that now I'm beginning to understand why not everyone's going to be able to leave the matrix. Only a few people were going to be able to leave the matrix, even Christians. And I'm not saying that they will never fully understand or fully come to some conclusions when they get to heaven, when it's fully, everything is exposed. But if you can't receive what you what you know the knowledge of it here on earth you're never going to be able to you're not going to be rewarded for it what you do on here on earth you're going to be rewarded for in heaven but once you're in heaven and you haven't de dealt with it down here on earth you're not going to be rewarded for it in heaven and with, in other words you're not going to be given credit for it god is trying to set us free he's trying to liberate the woman he's liberating humanity but he's got to liberate the humanity through the woman he liberates the he's already liberated us through a, a point through christ jesus he's given us salvation but in order to be fully liberated as as a, a human race we have to liberate the woman from these doctrines of demons this reptilian thinking that has removed the woman from her place in the godhead it removed her place from we've made uh, you know what i'm saying you know what i'm saying re re religious minded people understand what i'm saying women are men are up here and women are down here talk to any cult I mean, men are up here women are down here mormons women men are up here women are down here jehovah witness men are up here women are down here uh, muslims men are way up here women are way down there um, uh, Buddhism, men are up here, women are down here. Women have very little status for most of the world, which is why the men think they can use and abuse them. That's the reptilian mind. You can use and abuse women and children because women, children are kind of down here too with women. If they're male, they're a little higher. The girls, they're even lower than the, than the wife. They have very little status, which makes you and to appreciate what Job was thinking and why Job was the man he was because he was religious and yes he's had the same thoughts same feelings that's why he treated his friends much better than he treated his own wife that's what I'm saying just saying he treated his friends better than he treated his wife his men his friends were men the brotherhood wives not so much uh, down here you treat them any way you like okay just saying but anyway, it makes me understand it better. It makes me understand the enmity for the woman much better. It makes it all a lot, lot clearer. But anyway, great news, people. Great news. 
great news. God is sending us a message. And we're being set free. Isn't that amazing? And he's given us <laughs> he's giving us the title of Donna Ladies. We're ladies now. We're no longer controlled, manipulated, nothings. We are now given power and authority, and that's amazing stuff. So, anyway, good news for the church. And if you haven't given your life to Jesus, excuse me, Jesus Christ, there's still opportunity while well, the church is still here. So, um, and be part of this wonderful uh, new day, incredible new day. Nothing's ever going to be the same again, people. Nothing's ever changed. People want, I know that a lot of church want to go back to the way they were. They want, let's go back. <laughs> You know, we're okay. We were okay 10 years ago. We were okay five years ago. We were okay two years ago. Let's just go back. Let's not worry about the future. Let's not do what we used. Something new. Let's, no, we can't go back, people. There's no going back. No going back. The world's changing. We're changing. Life is changing, and it's no going back. And when we go forward, it'll only get better. You know, you think you, that's the reptilian brain trying to protect itself over there. That's the fear thing going, you know, we like the status quo. We like this, this, you know, we like the, the way we think. We like all that stuff. No, no, it's not happening anymore. I'm telling you right now, it's not happening because the bride ain't going to put up with it. Okay? That's, that's got to, that's got to change. It's all changing. It's not going back. We're not going back there. It's not the way it is. Okay? It's the same. But, <laughs> well, we still are here and, uh. You're given the opportunity for salvation. I would suggest you do what Jesus Christ tells you to do. And uh, that is be baptized. Repent and be baptized. Change your mind. Change your mind and be baptized. The coming of the Holy Spirit. That's why I want to talk about too. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And why it's threat, such a threat to men. That the Holy Spirit is feminine. Um, but I'll save that for my next. <laughs> I'll save that for my next video because that's the thing I'm thinking about you know is why are men so threatened by the fact that the Holy Spirit is feminine and there's a good reason for it and that's reptilian as well but let's just go back to the, the what Jesus said or Peter said to uh, the people who wanted to find out what to do about the fact that they had crucified the Lord Savior and this is what Peter said they were picked in their hearts and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles men and brethren what shall we do and Peter said unto them repent Change your mind and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus, for the remission of sin, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promises unto you and to your children, to all that are far off, even as many as our Lord God shall call. And with many other words, he exhort, testified and exhort, saying, Save yourself from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So this is a promise, people. It's a promise. You shall be saved. If you do are obedient to Christ Jesus and do what he tells you to do, and then you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit begins the process of sanctification, okay? Changing your mind. So I will talk to you in my next video, and um, yeah, <laughs> I will leave it at this. God bless and have a great day.